name is Sue Ellen Zagrabelny, and I'm the host of Mary's Eclectic Interests. Our guests tonight are Lars Walker and Denny Rosenko, and as you can see, they are dressed in Viking attire, and we are going to be talking about Vikings this evening, specifically about the Viking Age Club and Society. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. What can you tell me about the Viking Age Club and Society? Who wants to start first? The Viking Age Club was uh, originated in 1985 by uh, uh, a member of the Sons, a member of Sons of Norway, Gary Anderson, and myself. And we actually started the club by meeting up at the Sons of Norway Center headquarters. And we used to have a lounge area and a, a, a little bottle club up there. And we were sitting around looking at and having a, a drink. And we saw up on the wall that they had all these Viking gear up there. They had a sword, they had an ax, they had a, 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 and a spear, and then a helm with horns on it. And both of us sat there and said, this can't be true. We can't have horns on a Viking helmet. So we thought, we need to find out, a, find a way to make this program a little bit better and try to educate people about who the Vikings really were and give them an understanding of what was going on back in the Viking Age. Okay, so this was in 1985. Hey, Lars, when did you become involved with I this organization? I don't remember the exact year, but it was in the late 1990s, so I'm kind of a newbie still. And uh, I got involved. I had actually seen an article about this group on the Sons of Norway magazine when I was living in Florida. And I was thinking, why do I live in Florida? And they got this going on up in Minnesota. So when I moved back to Minnesota, I... Uh, made a point to get in, get to, to know them and get involved. Cool. Uh, the idea of, of coming together to make things more authentic, I think is exciting. Yes. Can you talk about yeah, that a little we, bit? Our, our focus, we had, you know, there's various ways that reenactors can become, you know, involved in programs and stuff and how they present themselves. We decided to, what we wanted to focus on is the education and preserving the arts and crafts of the Viking period. Okay. And what we wanted to do was to develop an atmosphere for which m people with those skills could come together and demonstrate those arts and crafts skills. So that makes it a real teaching tool then? Yes, we were very educational. Um, are you involved with that, Lars? Yeah, I do. Uh, we're both wearing, wearing, I do leather tooling. Oh, that's my craft, aside from selling my novels. And the uh, we're both wearing belts that, that I made uh, right tonight. So that's what I do. I also sell little, little bookmarks and things uh, for people, uh, souvenirs. Okay. Um, how about your, your attire? You both are dressed in tunics and other paraphernalia, accoutrements. Could you say something about those? Well, most of the time, with regards to our outfits that we have on this evening, this would be probably uh, considered a relatively wealthy Viking, have some money. Basically, you can tell that by the amount of material and excess material that we have on the tunics. Plus, uh, this would probably be part of a festive event, you know, where you're going to an, you know, a, a party or a big event, and you want to look your best. Okay, okay. The costumes themselves are made by members of our group. Uh, we have ladies who sew and, and like to make the costumes. And uh, so everything we have, I think the clothing we are wearing is all made by people in the group. Some of our, uh, some of our accoutrements are, are purchased. What about the, the leggings? When we were talking off camera large, you mentioned that they actually are wrappings. Yeah, I wear these uh, leg work leg uh, wrappings it's uh, uh they're wrapped around the leg we believe that's what vikings often wore uh it's very much like the putties that uh, the soldiers wore in world war one uh they're probably probably for um uh, 
protecting the, the pants, just the trousers, just to keep them from getting torn up by thorns and things, and also for warmth, because they're quite warm. I don't wear them in, in, on a hot day. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I notice yours have some bands that looks like they're, leathers. They're cro like a crossing. They're crossed. They were just, he uses the, ba the banding type that goes around. Mine are called what they call cross guarding, cross guarders, and they were crossed, crisscrossed, and wrapped. What type of lectures and demonstrations do you do with with your biking um, reenactors? Well, for my part of it, I do both, mostly a show and tell presentation. I bring, I talk about the clothing that they wore, and I bring in tools and weapons of the period, and I talk about just about anything in general. Usually, you, you, you go in with a semi-game plan, but usually what happens is people start asking questions and your, your game plan kind of goes out the window. So you want to let people, you know, in, get involved with the, with the program. And in my show and tell, that works for me. Okay. And what about you, Lars? Well, aside from the events we do, which of course are just, we set up a Viking camp with the tents and things, uh, when I do lectures, uh, I have a fairly uh, sophisticated uh, PowerPoint, a, ser a group of PowerPoint uh, presentations I've done. I've lectured on, on cruise ships a couple of times, and so I developed them for that. And I do them for Sons of Norway groups and other. I did one recently for an Icelandic group. And, uh, you know, they are they're lectures with pictures, and uh, I like to think they are very informative. Well, that's... That's important that, that people get accurate information. And, and what I'm hearing you both tell me is that you do things a little different stylistically, but you're doing the same kind of thing of getting information out uh, to people. And uh, you mentioned you've done some on cruise ships. Do you, you ever go to schools? Oh, yes. We've lectured at schools. We've lectured at other organizations. We've traveled pretty much all over the United States and Canada and Norway putting on presentations. Now I want to ask the questions about the weapons. <laughs> uh, who wants to do the show and tell on the knives? I didn't, uh, I didn't bring my long sword, but I, I happened to bring this. And it's, um, this is what's called a scramasax. It's a... Viking, the sword in the Viking Age was actually relatively rare. It was expensive, was hard to use, and you, can, you can't use it for anything else except fighting. So if you're not at war, a sword isn't much use to you. Every Viking man had a, uh, a scramasax. It was kind of a mark of a free man. And uh, it, you could use it as a chopper, a machete at home. You could use it as a butcher knife. You could also take it to war with you. So, uh, and this one was made for me, actually, by a fellow named Michael Z. Williamson, who may be familiar to uh, science fiction fans. He is, uh, he is a pretty well-known science fiction author, and uh, he's also a knife maker, and he made that to my request. It has, um, it has runes on it. It has uh, the runes, of course, of the Viking letters, the Viking alphabets. This... What it says here is under these under the skulu erner kluask, which means uh, breast to breast the eagles will claw each other, which was a line from a famous Viking poem and happens to have been almost the last words of the hero of my Viking novels. So uh, he put that in for me. Okay, um, and then you had a smaller knife. Yeah, this is. Uh, Every, everyone would carry a, uh, just a regular uh, knife like this, uh, bone handle, wood handle, just a utility knife. Okay. Not necessarily a weapon, but uh, this was made for me my, by my brother. Okay. I would be happier if you put them away. <laughs> All right. I just get a little nervous around... Big blades like that. Um, what about you? You had you mentioned something about this helmet that you wore around your neck, and we put it in the middle of the table. What can you tell that, me about that? That actually was uh, given to me as a gift at the Winter Olympic Games in Lillehammer, Norway. 
and the story goes that each morning when we went up to where the Viking encampment was, we would uh, get on a bus from where we were staying and drive up to where we were going to be demonstrating all day long. Well, we started striking up a conversation, my partner and I, Ron Peterson, and we uh, were basically sitting on the bus with these other two gentlemen about our age, in our age group, and those guys were working the weapons area. They were doing archery, spear throwing, axe throwing, and things like that. But as we started talking, Ron and I decided that what we would want to do is to give simple little gifts at the, at, when we were there. So we gave him a couple of little glasses of shot glasses with the Minnesota loon on it. Mm -hmm. And so, and they that and we, they thanked us. And the next morning, they get on the we get on the bus and they said they handed us these little boxes and these were inside the box. And I says, well, geez, this is nice. We can wear it, you know be great for wearing. And uh, he said, no, it's got another function. So he says, when we get off the bus, you come with us. So we went over and we christened our helmets. Those are shot glasses. Oh, how cool. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You wear them around your neck. You don't worry. You can't lose your, you can't lose your shot that, glass. Lose your shot oh, glass. That's, that sounds. Yeah. And so we christened their, their shot glasses and we, we christened ours. But that's a replica of the only Viking helmet that's ever actually been found in Norway. It looked like that with a spike on the top and the, uh, the op optical protectors. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I was just trying to put together between what you had said and what you had mentioned earlier that there had been only one Viking helmet found by archaeologists. Is that correct? Uh, in Norway. In, in Norway. Norway, okay. Um, now that you mentioned the 90, it's 94 Olympics? 1994 Olympics in Lillehammer. Okay. Would you talk a little bit um, about how you, the four of you that you mentioned mm -hmm. came to be a part of that? Well, it basically happened two years before the Olympics became a, an event. They were still play, you know, preparing it and building it. But in 1992, the Sons of Norway held their international convention at Lillehammer, Norway. And I went over as a guest just to take the ride because I wanted to see, see Norway for the first time. And I was also doing some research on my ancestors. So I took the trip over there. Well, while we were there, um, we were traveling around. Well, we were introduced to this group that was planning on having a Viking encampment there at the Olympics. Well, I sat down and started talking with them and asking them questions. And I just asked them if, you know, would they be interested in having some American Vikings come over and be part of your encampment? And they said, that'd be fine. <laughs> they said, so we just basically turned out. I went back after, at the, after the Sons of Norway convention was over with went back to the Viking group and asked anybody who wants to go to Norway to be part of the Viking encampment there. And four of us ended up going. It was okay. quite a story. And, and it was all by accident, just purely dumb luck, so to speak. Well, um, do you have some stories to tell? Oh, <clears throat> yeah, I do really have some interesting stories. Basically, um, when we first got into, we started actually up in Trondheim, Norway, and, and took buses down from Trondheim from there to Lillehammer. And of course, you always have little things that take place along the trip and tours. And we, were, we, we got there very, very early in the morning, so we were pretty tired. We just rested, and then we had an opportunity to go down into the, into the village of, of Lillehammer and, and visit a little bit. But uh, as we got into the, in, into the encampment, people were setting up all their equipment and everything and each morning each tent has some kind of thing happening inside of it so that people could go and see what was going on well one of them had a a, a baking oven that would bake buns in the morning and so they would go in there well one morning two of the young ladies that were working it came in a panic over to where Ron and I were in the encampment and said something's wrong with the uh, machine. So we said, uh, I couldn't get away because we, we had our equipment there and we didn't want any, somebody had to stay to watch it. Mm -hmm. So Ron went over and he looked around and 
he's checking it over and finding out what was wrong with it. And he said, and they, they, he finally went back and looked back behind the, the machine and plugged it in. <laughs> that was one. The most fun was you had, we were probably introduced by no more than probably 23 different countries' news TV stations who stopped at us because we were kind of unique. We were the Americans. Mm -hmm. And so people would come to see us. Well, there was this one Australia, Australian news crew, and the cameraman was having a problem with his case for the camera. It couldn't close. He'd lost a screw, tiny, tiny, tiny screw. And he said, well, uh, what can we do about this? Ron looks at the machine and he says, you got a little, you got a pair of sunglasses? And he says, yeah. So he takes the, sun, takes the screw out of the sunglasses, puts it into the camera, and he was able to close and work the camera. The guy turned to him and said, where did you learn how to do that? I said, I used to watch MacIver. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that we would do. I think uh, probably one of the most unique things that happened to us was when we were up near Stiklestad. We stayed overnight there, and we stopped over at the museum there. Stiklestad, of course, is the is the place where St. Olaf, you know, St. Olaf College, the patron yes. saint of Norway. He was a Viking. He was killed, martyred at the Battle of Stiklestad. Okay. Yeah. And so what we were doing at the museum there was uh, we were going to just look around and so. But the curator came up to us and asked us if, uh, you, know, the, we, you know, about the fact that we were from America, and he had wanted to know. For some reason or another, I think one of our people that we were staying with told him about our chainmail shirts that we had. And he came up and asked if he could, if there was a possibility that they could buy a chainmail shirt off of us. And I said, well, we don't sell them. And I said, well, but I, if you want to, I'll give it to you. Because we don't sell them. I'll give it to you. And he said, Billy? And he said, well, okay. Can you come back tomorrow? And he said, can you, and can you be dressed in your costume and everything? And we can have a small presentation. And I said, sure, we can do that. I think Ron and I dressed up in our gear the next morning. We got over there. This car is parked all over the place. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, the next thing we know, we walk in there. They had Norwegian TV, radio. Every broadcasting media that was around in Norway at that point was at Stiklestad, ready to do our presentation. Oh, how wonderful. And we presented it. By the time we got down to Lillehammer, they knew us from all over Norway. Oh, how wonderful. So, so that really kind of set the stage um, for, for your... Uh, uh, appearing in the camp. Yes. Um, what has that done for the group? Uh, does it kind of set a standard for how, um, you know, how you perform your reenactments? Well, it is an education because we were, I was there demonstrating how to make a chainmail shirt. I was actually demonstrating that in the encampment and uh, it was relatively closed so I couldn't work very long. I had to take my gloves off to work because you can't work with mittens on and try to <laughs> turn wire and stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would work for about 10 or 15 minutes and then I'd, I'd, I'd stop and stand and people would be walking by. But as soon as I took my gloves off, and they said, eh, the people would come in and see what was going on and they would point, point at me and says, oh, stick with that. That's all mm -hmm. they said, and I knew what they were talking about. They had seen me on TV mm -hmm. doing that. And what was nice about it, we had young people in the encampment there. The average age of these people that were working at this uh, encampment there were between 13 and, and 50 years old, but mostly young people that were uh, participating in this. So I had a young, he was about probably 12 years old or 13 years old, and he was uh, working the encampment, but he was fascinated by the chainmail making. He stopped in where I was working on. I was building a shirt there and I was going to donate it. And he sat there and worked and I taught him how to work with it. And he was already doing the chainmail. And every break he had, he'd come over to the to my tent and work the chainmail. He was already actually starting to do the lectures by the time he was done. Oh, and exciting. what was fun about it was the nicest thing about it was when I was done I gave it to him, the shirt, because mm -hmm. he had worked on it. Oh how wonderful. Yeah. 
Um, you've talked a little bit about um, preserving arts and crafts of Viking, and you you said Lars that you are a, a wire worker, leather worker, leather worker, and you're a wire worker. I do wire. I do also wood. I do carving, wood carving. I do this. I I make tents. I make. Oh my goodness! Yeah, I do a little bit of everything there. So, um, how does that play into your demonstrations? It's part of the thing we do. You you set up a camp. You're involved in your craft. Uh, you're explaining it to people. We'll we'll have a table out there with weapons. People are always interested to see the weapons. As he said, uh, the kids love to see the mail being made. That's always fascinating. It's it's uh, it's it's a living history show. That's that's fascinating. I I have been places like Williamsburg and other places and seen American history. This I I never knew something like this existed. Well, and what was unique about ours too is the fact that, um, like Lars was saying, we we demonstrate, but we also were hands on. We wanted we had kids actually sitting down and learning how to do this, and we taught them and we showed them how to do this. When we were in Minot for the North Coast Fest, uh, we would be there for ten days, and we'd go. We teach fourteen kids how to make a pouch, how to make a board game, how to make a necklace how to do anything. They make their own shields and design them. And these kids would become part of our encampment and they would show people, they would become the demonstrators. Oh, how wonderful. So they would demonstrate to the people how things were being done. And during the week, uh, Gary Anderson, myself and Helen and Barb Hines would go to the schools and lecture. We would lecture over a five day period to about anywhere from 15 to 20 schools. My goodness, that's that's a um, steep schedule. Yes, um, Lars, you mentioned that um, you have have done PowerPoint lectures and so forth. It, are your lectures mainly geared toward adults? Uh, generally, I work with adults. I haven't done the school uh, lectures as uh, like the other groups have. Usually, I, it has been to adult groups. Sons of Norway Lodges, especially, but but other groups, it's uh, you know narrating the history and trying to bring it alive. Uh, a lot of people are interested. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't know much about it. A lot of people know a lot of things that are wrong. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and that's that goes back to the authenticity of of bringing together um, information authenticity and making it come alive. That's what I'm hearing from yes. both of you. How can uh, individuals and organizations get in contact with you? Well, we, we do have a web page at uh, vikingage.com, just vikingage.com. Uh, it's not in very, it's kind of unconstructed at the moment. Really right now, the best way to contact us is through our Facebook page which you just do a search for Viking Age Club and Society Sons of Norway, and we are quite open to uh, outs you know, outside people who are not members of our group or Sons of Norway. If you want to become a member, want to get involved, we are happy to have you. Our, our, or, the way we organize it is if you join the Sons of Norway, and you don't have to be Norwegian to join the Sons of Norway, if you join the Sons of Norway, then you can be a member of our group at no other charge. Interesting. So it's just the cost of uh, setting yourself up with your costume and equipment. Very interesting. Um, what, what else can you tell me about the authenticity? We talked a little bit about crafts, teaching people the proper way of things. What about um, when you're in the encampments, what kinds of foods do you eat? Or do you take authenticity down to that level? We have in the past. Um, we've set up our encampments, especially when we used to go down to Decorah, Iowa. We would actually stay in the encampment there and we'd, we'd prepare meals. 
Most of our meals were either soups or stews because that's the simplest thing to prepare without having all the other equipment that you need. So we would prepare it for amongst ourselves. We wouldn't do it for the public, but amongst okay. ourselves. Okay. Um, my last question is always, do either of you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, I'll go with Lars first. Uh, if anyone wants more information and you don't have access to Facebook, uh, my uh, email address is lars at larswalker.com and I'll be happy to, uh, to forward any information. Perfect. What about uh, you? Pretty much the same thing. Uh, you can contact me through my uh, email address and it's just dennisrosinko at aol.com. One word, lowercase. Okay. And basically, we're, we're always looking for people who have a strong interest in learning and preserving an art or a craft skill or wanting to learn an art or a craft skill that is from the Viking Age. We don't stop at one thing. We're trying to work with the possibility of having iron work done. Uh, so we have, we're trying to set up a portable forge so that we can do iron, small, small forms of iron work. Um, we try to bring in as much uh, talents and skills that we want, you know, that people have. There's a lot of talented people out there, but they don't have a backdrop or a format or a way to present themselves. And we're trying to develop that through the Viking Age Club. We are giving them the atmosphere to be creative. I should probably also mention that some of our members, we do do some, some combat, uh, blunt weapon combat. We call it live steel combat. I used to do that. I'm getting a little old now. But we do have younger members who, are do, who do do that. And uh, some of the younger people especially uh, look forward to that. And that is something we do have to offer. Any final words for our evening? Well, we've enjoyed it here. And, and, and we hope that uh, from this little get together here, we can get people even interested in our group. That would be terrific. How about you, Lars? Anything? Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It was a great privilege. Well, thank you both, Denny and Lars, for joining us at Mary's Eclectic Interests. We look forward to seeing you next time. Sharing your passion starts with taking that first step. Take Will, for example. His first step was taking free TV classes at CCX Create. He's learning production skills and now has access to cutting edge equipment. He's working on local music productions, meeting new people, and gaining the experience needed to produce his own show. Best of all, he's sharing his passion for music with others in the community. Share your passion. Visit ccxmedia.org.